remarkable, in fact, more miraculous about the Book of Mormon than its Kulturgeschichte, culture history. It is just loaded with the details that go up to give us an insight into the culture of particular people, and it describes three distinct cultures, and it describes them very vividly. The Near East, the Old World, we've been talking about that, time of Lehi. Remember, the first book of Nephi takes place all in the Old World, well, the most important of the books. And it describes the ancient civilization of the New World, totally different civilization in detail, great detail, of course. And it describes the present culture, which is as far removed from Joseph Smith's day as his, the other cultures are. Whoever dreams of the culture of the 80s, which he has so vividly described, well, that's all in the Book of Mormon. But now, he couldn't have chosen a better year to have things begin than the year 600. 600 AD, that's the one you notice we're giving us a, a nice round number. And this is, this, historians call this the pivotal year. Uh, what? You mean BC? Is it BC? AD. <laughs> A.D. is different. That's when Gregory the Great founded and started new things moving in Europe. We won't go into that today, though. No. Uh, B.C. Yeah, that's when he sent a letter to England and the, and the English started to be converted, but there were, well, two churches and all that. Well, uh, uh, yes, the, the pivotal year. The pivotal year, uh, that name has been given. There's a book, in fact, by Carl Jaspers, the German historian, historian philosopher. Jaspers. Carl Jaspers, the pivotal year. H.G. Wells uses that in his once celebrated history of the world and so forth. Everybody notice that around the year 600, everything pivots, everything changes. The whole world turns on a pivot, and very suddenly you have an entirely new culture and civilization nations throughout the entire world. We saw this happening also in 1200 BC, 600 years before the same sort of thing happened. And what was it? Well, it was the climate. It was the people of the sea being driven there. Uh, the Sickles and the Sardis and the Terranio and the Philistines. See, the Philistines settled at that time, the same time the, we see it, saw from the Amarna letters, you see, the same time the Hebrews were moving in, the Philistines were moving in on the coast. And all the early books of the history of Israel have to do with the conflicts and agreements and friendships between the Philistines and Israel, because they were very close together. Now, the Philistines were Greeks, and they settled there back in, in 1200. That's why it's called Palestine. It's named after the Philistines, see, because they settled in Palestine. These uh, people were named, the lands are named after the places where they settled, not the places where they came from. The Terenio, or those who settled in Terenio and became Etruscans, they came from Asia Minor. And uh, the Sicles, those who settled in Sicily, and, so, and the Sardis, those who settled in Sardinia. Finally, they tried to settle in Egypt. And uh, in a tremendous battle, Micarinus drove them back on the east branch of the Nile, so they had to go on the coast further, up and they settled in Palestine and so forth. But anyway, we have here, the 600 is another of those big times when everything changed. The same sort of calamities happened. In 600 was the passing of the old sacral kingship. That culture between them, you see, kings were sacred and, and the temple. The king was never, never crowned in the palace. He was always crowned in the, in the temple, of course. Kingship was sacred. The kingly line was sacred. It was the patriarchal line. This was so in almost all cities. There's a great deal on this subject. But all of a sudden, the sacral kingship passed away. And the question arose, who's in charge around here? Anybody who could grab the power. And so you have the age of tyrants, and you have the new and ambitious age of emperors and things like that. But first, why? And this all is relative to the Book of Mormon, because it's the same thing. You see, in the picture in the Book of Mormon, as it starts up, everything is then upheaval. Poor Nehi doesn't know what to do. He prays desperately. He goes out about his business, and then he has a vision, comes home. There's nothing to do. He has to leave. He has to get out. We'll talk about that the next time, his, his means of departure and so forth. But uh, everything's in upheaval. His own family is split down the middle. We saw the last time one side is for supporting Babylonia, and the other side is, is for Egypt. They had been the other wise. They'd shift... They shifted positions. At this time, you see, no one has any particular loyalties. It's free enterprise everywhere, and you see money is behind everything here. We'll see why this is literally the case. We saw that, how Semiticus, the, the 26th dynasty, the great last dynasty of Egypt, which was the dynasty under which Lehi lived and so forth, and Egypt was a, uh, was a protectorate of it, as a matter of fact. Well, how does the Book of Mormon start out? the first year of King Zedekiah. Well, Zedekiah was put in by Necho II. His name wasn't Zedekiah. Necho II, the Pharaoh, gave him that name. So here we are, and he, he be, the king of Egypt puts him in, who was Necho II. And how could Necho II do it? Because he had a lot of money. Where did he get it? He got it from Gyges, who was Gyges. He was uh, the big man, 
in, the, in Sardis, which was the capital of Lydia, where they had just invented money. It had been coined in the 8th century. They had invented money, and don't think that started, uh, uh, didn't make a difference. Because the money was necessary, the situation required it, you see. That freed everybody to go around and do pretty much what they wanted to. What happened to the Sacral Kingship? What wiped them out? Now we have to go into a little geopolitics here. This is important because it lasts all the time. And notice the thing, it happens, it can only happen in Palestine. Palestine is the cockpit of the world. It is today, and it always was, and uh, it was in Lehi's time too, and it was before, 1200. Why? Because that's the only place in the world where the sea invades the land mass to a great extent. The sea goes right into the middle of the great European African land mass. comes together. Well, this is what the, the picture is. Well, we'll, we'll go well like this. We'll, we'll make a, just a little dinky map here. Whoops. And then here goes in then India here, and, and here's Ceylon down here. Got to get a little, a little larger map down here. Here's, Here's the Euxine, here's the Black Sea up here, here are the oil fields, and here are the Greeks down here, and here's Libya over here, and uh, so it goes, here's Abyssinia here. Now the, oh, we've made it too high. But anyway, the, this, the, it's called geopolitics, it, it was what pushed Hitler into World War III. We wouldn't have had World War II, we wouldn't have had World War II if it wasn't for geopolitics. Well, his idea was it was behind everything, and it was the doctrine of geopolitics. Uh, we, it's good to be have here because this shows the role that Palestine plays, why this is so extremely important along here. Uh, politics. And it was invented by Halford Mackinder, a Scottish geographer, in the early 20th century. Halford Mackinder. Halford Mackinder. And it was taken up by Haushofer, who was Hitler's official geographer. Uh, Haushofer, excuse me. Karl Haushofer, who was Hitler's. This is geopolitics. This is Halford Mackinder. I guess it's Mac, I don't know. No, that's better. And, uh, and Haushofer. And the theory is very plain. It's already been expounded long ago. Thomas Henry Buckle, way back there in the, in the early days. You can take something like, there's a good expedition of it by, by, uh, by uh, Buckminster Fuller. He talks a lot about the land pirates and the sea pirates, culminating in World War I. Well, it's this idea. There is Central Asia is controlled by the land, the land people. The great land mass of Central Asia is called the Asiatic Shield. The shield is that part which is covered by snow about half the time, half the year, so you can see it from space. It, it, it's shaped like a shield, too. And here are the great people of the plains, the Central. This is the clock. This is the driving force of history. Whenever there's trouble, it begins there. Why does it begin there? Because these people are nomads in the vast central part of Asia, living on grass, and their economy, therefore, is quite sensitive. It's a marginal economy. In a bad year, they have to move. And they're able to move because they're nomads. They, they tour all the time. And where do they go? Naturally, they move to the richer and more prosperous civilizations on the periphery. All the world's civil civilizations lie on the periphery here in India, and in Egypt, of course, and in Europe. And notice, in every case, there is a wall, a literal wall. They build a literal wall to keep them out. You know, here we have the wall, here we have the Khyber, the pass in the wall, but then, then we have the those of Alexander, the, the iron gates and so forth. There's a, uh, the, the pass up here. And uh, the Pharaohs always, from pre-dynastic times, they built the, the white wall of the north, the wall of the Amu, the wall to keep the Asiatics out. It was always a wall, uh, Senua, in the time of Shezhong, the well, Cesar, I believe the Cesar's just the first, describes how when he was escaping, what a hard time he had getting past the guards there. This is the wall that keeps them out, and you know, in uh, the Cilician gates here to keep them out here. And in Europe, the Romans built the vast one running clear from the Black Sea right over to the Rhine, following along the, uh, the Danube, and it is the, they're called the Limes. Always fortified the whole length right up to the North Sea, from the Black Sea to the North Sea, the Limes. Forts at a distance, walls in between, to keep out various barbarians, always pushing in. Whenever times got bad, these people are desperate, they move in, they want to take over, and they usually succeed. So wave after wave, there have been 11 waves have moved in here, 11, left 11 different languages in India like the, like the skins of an onion. So you, you had the vast Lemus, 
ending finally, if you go clear up to northern England, to Scotland, you find Hadrian's Wall up there, and it still stands, Hadrian's Wall, the last block to block from the, the, uh, from the Picts and the Scots to keep them out of the empire. And then the greatest wall of all, they had a big problem back here in China because China was wide open to the steppes, wasn't it? <laughs> Except for they used the mountains for the, and they built the Wall of China, 1,500 miles long. They built that huge wall just to keep these people out of the center. But when everything's go bad, they always spread. Well, as Buckminster Fuller says, World War I was a contest between the sea pirates, the British Empire, whose fleet was, of course, whose force was in the sea, and the land pirates, who were the Central, Euro the Central European powers and Russia along with it, and this is why I say this is so important, this is where the two really come together. The only place in the world where, for thousands of miles, the sea actually invades the main landmass. This is Africa, this is Asia, this is Europe. They all come together right here, and the sea comes in and meets them all right there. This is the place you have to control if you're going to control the world. This was the theory of Haushofer, anyway. This is why Hitler had his, his Egyptian expedition and Rommel and all that sort of thing. So we have these people going, and it was so too. Now, in the time of Lehi, Necho II, whose rule lasted to, lasted to 595, from usually considered about 604, 605, some say 609, to 595, he lived right at the time that Lehi left Jerusalem. He decided he couldn't stand up to the combined powers to, to Assyria. Assyria was knocked out, remember, by Persia and Babylonia getting together, and then they start knocking each other out. But, uh, and so he invested in a navy, and at that time, they, See, it's a time of new inventions, new enterprises, all sorts of things, a new invention, revolutionized naval warfare, and it was the trireme. Well, we got Necho II here. The trireme was invented by the Corinthians, and he, he bought several hundred of them and hired Corinthians to man them and train crews for them, and he dominated the seas, and Necho II actually, remember, who died in 595, five years after Lehi left Jerusalem. Remember, Lehi left Jerusalem well before the fall. He got out in time. But uh, he sent a ship, actually, a, not a trireme, but it was an expedition, an expedition, clear around Africa. That's well attested. He sent an expedition around Africa. He built a canal from the Red Sea to the Nile, which you have so beautifully delineated here. They w went over to one of the, the, uh, to one of the uh, branches of the Nile, eastern branch, and uh, he had this carrion navy, he was quite the person, and he bankrolled, uh, he was bankrolled by Gyges, here's Asia Minor, here's Lydia here, here's Sardis, his capital, this man Gyges. Fabulously rich, he was so rich he could get, because they invented money in his time, and he took advantage of that, he was right on the scene. And this gave an enormous advantage, everyone wanted to trade like crazy in these days, they were getting around a lot, you see, and the, you had to have some medium of exchange. They had them, they had money of various forms and sorts. This was the first real money, just, uh, just less than a century before Lehi, so money gets into the Book of Mormon and plays an important part, and we find out later. The Nephites themselves designed their own monetary standards, and they set it up to suit their own conditions from time to time, and they end up with an ideal monetary system, which is described there, and which Professor uh, Richard Smith of Harvard, who is a member of the church, uh, showed it was the most perfect monetary system that could be possibly divided, the most economical, requiring the least number of coins for the greatest number of of exchanges and deals and so forth. It was a model. It's based of all things on sevens and threes and things you'd never expect a monetary system, but it, it's the beautiful one. And the Lehi, Joseph Smith invented it. See, 23-year-old hick from the sticks. <laughs> he figured it all out. Uh, well, anyway, this money was very important. And he was the one that... Uh, he was bankrupt by Gyges. Well, this tells the story of what's going on at this time. This would be typical. Because he had the money. And Gyges could do anything he wanted because he had money. The famous story of the Ring of Gyges. The honest man, a Greek proverb, is a man who will be honest even though he has the Ring of Gyges. The idea is that the Ring of Gyges made you invisible so that you could do anything you wanted. If you had that much money, you see, you, nobody would question you. Uh, but a truly honest man doesn't make any difference. Even if he has the ring of Gyges, we could say you would still be honest. But who would be honest with the ring of Gyges when you can get away with anything? But he was followed by a man known better to you, who is the richest man in the world. And this is typical of what goes on. And he was uh, Croesus. As rich as Croesus, we know that. He was, he was also uh, the tyrant of, uh, of Sardis. You say, well, how do these men get to be in charge? This is another thing. 
if, if the king's gone, I said, everybody was asking, who's in charge around here? Well, now, what it would have to be was somebody who was able to take charge, some of the personality and force and so forth. And these were the tyrants. Everywhere you find tyrants at this time taking over. Tyrants, the name comes to be bad because he can do anything he wants to and get away with it. But the tyrants were really a great necessity originally. A tyrant was a person of unusual skill and capacity who with his friends was able to take over. He says things are going bad, so we'll take over now. And would, was able to hire soldiers and so forth. And so all these men are known as the tyrants. And so you have Polycrates, you have Pisistrus in Athens, and you have Cleisthenes, and you have Polycrates, and you have Dionysus in Syria. <coughs> Wherever you go, you find these tyrants ruling. And the kings of Egypt were really just tyrants. They were just a, a rich family that made them terror, put themselves in charge of the Sidic area of Egypt, and then, and then hired armies, hired carrion troops, paid for by Gyges' money, and they were in business, and they trade things and so forth. Very active trade at this time, remember? Lehi was a man exceeding rich, and he traded a lot. He went, up, went about his business and the like, and the most important ta uh, river town in in the Book of Mormon is Sidon. Well, Sidon was the great port through which Israel traded at that time. It was open to the Western world, and Sidon is it. Uh, but the tyrants were, were a remarkable group of men, and so they... Uh, remember, Plato thought he could make Dionysus II of Syracuse the model king, the philosopher king. But unfortunately, his father had been a tyrant too, and he'd spoiled him. And he wasn't company, he wasn't able to do it. But wherever you go, uh, you'll find them. Uh, they'll turn up. Uh, what are some of the others? Well, we, we mentioned those in Athens and, uh, and in Sparta. And they will emerge, but they can't last, you see. Uh, they immediately, their democratic risings against them. People get together. Uh, their main enemies, of course, are the important families. They're rival tyrants. If you can be a tyrant, I can be a tyrant. So then always you find assassinations, murders, uh, great and bloody events. This becomes the theme of the of the Greek tragedies, you'll notice, after the settling down, they take us back to an earlier time, when the people first, way back in 1200, when the people first settled down, they talk, as Aristotle says, their subject is tragicotris, it's necessarily tragic, it is lofty. It deals with the, with the rivalries and bittery, bitterness of the great houses uh, among themselves, because since anybody can claim to be king, uh, to, uh, and claim the right, uh, the rivalries are, are relentless. Of course, the intermarriages, and then the betrayals, and then the plots, and then plotting with somebody outside, and then accusing each other of treason. This goes on. This is the theme of Greek tragedy, which is by nature, he says, tragedy, because it's what people do for power. This is the power of the great house. It happens at a lofty level. That gives it its majesty. It sweep the long robes and the stuff like that. But the, uh, the tyrants uh, are a very real factor. And you notice these elements appear in the Book of Mormon, all through the Book of Mormon, uh, very vividly. A, a good example. There are several tyrants, like uh, Zizram, or or you get one, especially uh, Amalekai, a uh, mortal rival of, of uh, Ammon, uh, not of Ammon, of, uh, and against them you have the heroes. See, this is the other side of uh, Alma. And he wanted to be king many a time, you remember, a man by intrigue and uh, secrecy and uh, bribery got himself to be king. Happens again and again in the Book of Mormon. See, when you transplant a culture, you take the whole thing with you. Don't, nobody invents a new culture. You have it already built into you because the hundreds of years behind it and so forth. But this has changed. Everything's being pulled up by the roots in this time. So we have these things happening here, and uh, we have migrations everywhere, <laughs> colonies. As I say, these people are forced to move, and they do move in, and uh, they make trouble, and the other people who had lived there before are uprooted. They go looking for better homes. The formula becomes a promised land. We are looking for a promised land. and. Uh, they're led by a leader, a patriarch. Patriarch means father leader, the leader of the colony, the leader of the group. See, they, they go out and look for places to settle as colonies. Sometimes they would have mother cities, which is metropo the word metropolis means metropolis, your mother city that sends you out. And the Greeks at this time were sending out um, mother uh, uh, colonies everywhere as uh, uh, as feelers. Could we settle here? They'd try to settle here and be driven out. They'd try this, they try, but they, it ended up with a whole network of colonies every. Every one of the greater cities or greater settlements are those that survived. And the reason that they made the colonies was so they could survive themselves, so they'd have some place to run when they were overrun. Athens Acropolis held out. Uh, some of the Omega held out, and so was part of it. But uh, very few of them did. They were overrun, they scattered. So they scattered in all directions this way. But what was going on in one place was going on in another place. There is one you will find at this time, one architecture, the same 
the same civic, the same urban architecture, urban lifestyle, whether you went to China or whether you went to Spain, you'd find it. You'd find the same language pretty well. We're talking about the Middle East now. It was Aramaic, now it's become Greek. We see already in Lehi's time, the Egyptian army and the Egyptian navy were both Greek, and what's more, the Babylonians and the Syrians, they were hiring Greek soldiers, and Palestine was swarming, not with just Greeks, but with Jews, and with Libyans, and with Amu, and with Hittites, and with Celts, and with Goths, people speaking our own language. They're all mixed up in this mess. It's a time of world upheaval, such as the time we live in today. Well, are we approaching even more so? They look for their promised lands. I think the best thing to do would be, uh, and of course, many people are out of a job, any kind of work, and so we become a mercenary. mercenary. You would hire yourself out. And I think the best thing is this little book here. It's a very nice one. This is a collection of all the lyric poets of the Greeks that occur very early. The 6th and 7th centuries, oh, these are the poets that were writing at this particular time. And they show us very clearly, because they're very personal, they're very intimate, often very bitter, uh, and family histories and so forth, they tell us exactly what's going on. They're, sc they're scattered everywhere. We have here, and we start out with, get up, we start out with, it says 8th century, Shechem Optum, and we have Kalinus. Here is a good example. They're living, Kalinus is a poet in, in Western Asia Minor, and the Sumerians are moving in. They're going, to, they're going to be Europeans later on, but they're moving in in great droves of them. They're moving with their flocks and their herds because there's no grass on the plains. They're moving through Asia Minor and coming in. <coughs> when these people have been luxurious and satisfied for quite a while, they're very wealthy, and he can't get the youth to do anything. He's trying to get them stirred up and exciting because they're spoiled and they're just sitting on their behinds and doing nothing. Mechristel, how many a great oration, stirring oration, starts up with those words, Mechristel, how long, how long is this going to go on? Cicero, of course, the famous Catiline orations, how long, and so forth. Mechristel, cut a case, how long here are you going to sit on your behinds all the time? Quot alchemon hexatitumen, who you, when you should be, stirring up here, uh, stirring yourself up to a little alchemon thumen, have, getting a little, having a little guts for a change. Oh, no, young man, oh, oh youth of the land. Who died this? I'm fitter. Doesn't it, aren't you ashamed of yourself to sit around here unable to make up your minds? Don't you know what's coming down on us? Most of you spend your time getting drunk. And you think you're in peace and everything's going to be all right. And Well, you're going to find out because presently, Atar, overnight, Polemos Gayan Hapasenake, war will overrun the whole country. But it was, it, they couldn't realize what was happening, see, when these things happen. When these times happen, it's like the forest fire. Say, we stand around for a while, now it can't spread much more, and before you know it, all sorts of things are happening. Uh, and then he goes into a routine appeal to patriotism, the old appeal, and asks him if it was true, uh, for home and country and all this sort of thing. Now, these appeals are found in the Book of Mormon, too, as you know, and this was written uh, about 100 years before Lehi, and, but now we come to, the, to his own century, and we get to... Uh, to Terpander. Uh, here's a good example. This is, uh, no, no, Terpander, we go to Archilochus here. Uh, we have a lot from Archilochus. He was a soldier and a merchant, but as he, as he tells us in his first elegy here, Amy de Gotherapon and Eliaio Anactos. I am a servant to this, uh, this uh, the boss, the, an annex, it's the old Homeric word, an annex means a the prince achieves someone who's taken authority. It's not the king, it's not one with, but to general. To, to general, it's like your Central American generals and colonels that take over. Uh, it's easy to annex. To any alias, I'm, I'm uh, bound to service to him, but in really, really, I have this great gift and I should be a poet, he says. Caemus Ion Eraton Doron Epistamus, even though I know the beloved gifts of the muses. I have to serve this heel, he says. And then, he goes on and talks about uh, the antibalistic missiles. He's very much against them. He says these new weapons they're trying, these fancy new weapons. I don't, I don't put any trust at all in these new uh, far shooting bows and special slings and war machines and things like that. Give me the old fashioned sword. It's the only honest way a soldier can fight and so forth. They, they didn't want these new things. But notice this. Now he was uprooted and he is fighting. Uh, there's a good one here. Echo three for wayside salmon about it. Here's a good one. <coughs> he is now serving Semeticus in Egypt. 
Semitic is the one who is supporting Israel, you see, against and so forth, and uh, Lehi's time. He's getting his money from Gyges, but he is serving, and he's getting Gyges' money back from Semitic. Semitic is hiring Greek, Greek mercenaries. He's the king of Cyrus. Remember, this 26th dynasty is called the Sa'idic dynasty, Sa'is, and he talks about it here. Sa'is, because it's in the... Uh, here's the Nile here, the east and west Nile. Sa'is is here, you see, and Tanis is here. It's not exactly on the on this particular branch, but it's a little one inland. That was Sa'is. This was... Sa and he says... Uh, Well, he says, my beautiful Saitish Sa'it shield, Saitic shield, is lying in a bush somewhere where I left it with great judi and with great discretion, judiciously withdrawing from the battle, which would have ended my days. He says, why should I fight for someone for that kind of pay? Entos uh, amomen kalipon ukethalon. I left it behind. Uh, undamaged, in perfectly good condition. He said, I left my weapon behind in, in perfectly good condition, uh, but I didn't leave it willingly, but I left it. Autos defecun thanaton tellus, but I would have ended up dead if I hadn't. So he said, I did leave it. And, I, and they said, Aspis akeni erito, well, I wish it good luck. And this is so typical of the times. Ex autis ktesemai ukakion. I can buy myself another just as good. Oh. No sense of loyalty because he's a paid, he's a hireling. Yeah, there, there's a famous poem about one of the Prussian guard of Frederick II. Frederick II was a fireball. You had to. Uh, conquer the world for the king, of course. This is the 18th century wars, which are purely personal, lots of gallantry, theater, and so forth. But <coughs> at the battle of whatever it was, uh, begins with an F, he, uh, Frederick was raging and storming, he says, for fluctor curls, this is treason, this is, uh, this is betrothed. You're deserting me. The fire got too hot. He says, it was just like hail, and there the soldiers turned and started to fall back. He's the Prussian guard. And he says, you're for Fluchter kills, this is the reason. And one of them says, I, Fritzl, nicht vom Betrug für 14 Pfennig ist heute genug. He says, no, Fritzl, that's the affectionate name, the con. This is not a case of treason. I've done enough today for my 14 cents. The soldiers were paid 14 cents a day, you see. I've done enough for my 14 cents today. I'll do more tomorrow, he says. But for 14, for 14 Pfennig ist heute genug, he says. Well, so, the same thing here. Well, I can buy myself another shield. He's not worried. He has... See, because it's free enterprise, I'm for myself. If the business doesn't pay, I'll go over to another corporation. I don't, nobody feels loyalty to anybody. See, these men are tyrants. They, they could hold the people as long as they could. That's why tyrant has come to have the, the meaning it has. A person who cracks down and uses force and violence and trickery to put over his deals and so forth and will stop at nothing. That's tyrannical. Originally, I say they performed a necessary purpose. Well, <coughs> now, the same time he's serving in the Egyptian army, his brother is serving in the Babylonian army on the other side. This is typical. He'd hire, he had to hire himself out, too. And this is the way things went. Uh, he talks about Clay's... Oh, here's some of his, his army talk is really good here. Uh, <coughs> this is certainly the spirit of the times now. This is what, what do you depend on in a case like this? See, where are your loyalties now? Because uh, economic upset, everybody's uprooted, there's nothing you can count on, the market's collapsed and everything else. Panta tuke kai moira, Pericles, Pericles is his friend, he's addressing here, Pericles Andrididosi. Anything you get, it happens to be by tuke or by moira, by chance or by accident, by fate. By fate or by accident, that's all there is. Now, at the Battle of Chironea, where where the great Demosthenes threw away his shield when he ran from the field, on his shield was inscribed, the substance of his faith, te tuke, faith to luck, to lady luck. That's all you could hope on anymore when they had lost that sort of thing. And Euripides has a favorite chorus, and he ends five plays that way. I say the great plays reflect. They're, they are tragic because of, of the tragic situation you're constantly finding yourself in in this world. And what is the essence of tragedy? It's not the good guys against the bad guys. Never in the Book of Mormon will you find that. No, no good army fights a bad army ever. <coughs> and... Uh, but what is it? What is it that, uh, that brings these people together and what, what causes this? How do, how do you explain it? Well, you give up, usually, uh, without the gospel, and uh, you say what Euripides says in his uh, plays. He puts this at the end, I say, at least five of his known plays end with this chorus that they poli morphi ton domini on the, the gods take many forms, uh, fate takes many forms, poli they optus crinus if they are, and many unexpected things that, uh, they bring to pass. Kaite doke sent ukataleso, the things we had been taught all our lives to expect were right, ukataleso doesn't go don't go into fulfillment at all. It doesn't turn out that way. Ta dadoketon, or ton dadoketon, poron herotheos. But somehow or other, God finds a way 
to bring about the one thing we least expected, the thing we had never, things that not okay, the things we'd never taught to expect, we'd never been taught to expect, turns out okay, to put, God finds a way to fulfill them. And he uses God in the singular, this is God he's talking about. And he says, and you want to know how this happened? He's just ending the tragedy. Point, toy, and decay to who to point, and that's how this happened. See, because I say the essence of tragedy is not black versus white, the good guys versus the bad guys, black hats and white hats. It's the incompatibility of two good things. You have to decide, and they're both good. What can you do about it? See, the first Greek tragedy is that of the Hicotetis, the, the, uh, the suppliants. And what are they supplicating about? Well, the 50 daughters of Danaeus uh, have fled uh, to the king of Argos. And it begins... And they fled because from Egypt, always between Egypt and, and, and Greece, you know, Egypt is right in Egypt, Israel, Greece, they're all right together here. And because they don't want to marry their cousins. By Egyptian law, they should marry their cousins. And by Arabic law, they should too. You marry your bint ami, the, the daughter of your maternal uncle. You're supposed to. But for a Greek, that was a horror. That was uh, almost a form of incense. They couldn't do it. But if they didn't marry their cousins, the king of Egypt promises to come and make war against Argus. So the king has his choice. Should we make this choice? No marriage and plunge the nation in a deadly war, or should we let our daughters, let his 50 daughters of Danaeus, marry the, the sons of Egypt? And, uh, you know, it's like uh, Joseph and Asenus again, the same thing. Should Joseph the, marry Asenus, uh, the daughter of the high priest of Heliopolis? Was that right? Well, the rabbis talked and talked about that. But this, what was the choice, you see? You had either choice, war, or breaking a high moral law. The one or the other, and they were both moral. It was immoral to plunge your nation in war. It's immoral to do that. And this is the typical situation. So the scene opens with the king. His opening words are, Pedes, Hranein, Frey. Children, we must think about these things. We must weigh the situation. So we have all the necessity of thinking about these things, putting them together, considering the issues. This is the sort of time that we're living in here as we are today. Now, it's a different time today. You have no idea how different it is from what is when I was teaching 50 years ago. Believe it or not, half a century ago I was teaching. Isn't that wild? Uh, <laughs> so we go on here. Well, he has some other things to say. Uh, about various things. Um, here's one about Alcibiades, about the fig tree. Uh, you know, the various homes that they had, they all, where they, his family moved around, couldn't settle anywhere, you see, and this was the, was the trouble. Uh, but, he wants to keep, he talks about Gyges here, he talks about Gyges and his great wealth. I, have, I don't want to get as rich as uh, Gyges. He says, I have no desire to become as rich as Gyges. Most people don't. There were plenty of ambitious people who did, you see. I don't, uh, such a zeal doesn't seize me. I don't rejoice in such things. They own Gera Megales to Ukere Oterinidas. I do not wish Erga Megales. I do not have any envy of the work of a tyrant. And he wears the word tyrant. I have a tyrant here. Theon ergo, the work of God's megales to ukereo, I do not ask for the work of a, of, a, of a tyrant, or I do not ask for the wealth of Gyges. And they go together. If you have the wealth, he has the power. Of course, power and gain is one of the very main themes in the Book of Mormon, seeking power and gain. Everybody does there, you see. And then he says, Aprathon kai esti ophthalmonon, let such ambition be far from my eyes. He wants to preserve his integrity, so he has it doing, uh, does a hard time having it. And the... Uh, the famous, to show how hard it is, is the famous lines on his, uh, on his spear. Is that Archilochus? Oh, it's Minerus talks about the spear well. Uh, no, it isn't. Please find next of haste day. He talks about... Yeah, personal... He talks about... Uh, yeah, well, here's careerism. <laughs> this is a good example. There are ambitious people, he says. Nunde Leophilus Menarche. Well, at last, the Leophilus is in charge of everything. He's talking about his unit in the army. Leophilus de Picrate. Leophilus bosses everybody. Leophilo de Pantaceta. Everybody has to come to Leophilus with their problems. Leophilus de Acuto. And let everybody hearken to what anything Leophilus says. Good old Leophilus. He got where he wanted to be. He keeps bugging him. Leophilus Menarche. Leophilus de Picrate. Leophilus de Pantaceta. Leophilus de Acuto. Everything to Leophilus. So he wants it. He can have it, he says. And, uh, and then he says, 
the democratic ideal of the soldier. Here's the officer, the, the, the climber, uh, the important person, the careerist, as he's talking about here. Uh, the brass. Ufelio megan stratagon uta dia plegbenon. I have no, I don't particularly love these tall, strutting, uh, uh, overdressed generals. Uta buttrukrikoisi garon uta upexere monoi. Or uh, with their strutting around with their chins in the air, their hair carefully wind blown. Cur uh, uh, bustru, bustru hoisi means in, in, in blown curls. Their hair wind blown. Their chins high in the air, garon. And upexere monon. Ud hupexerimon and with their lofty airs, he said. But give me a short, underslung, hairy, tough little guy who can stand in the ranks and really do some fighting. He says it's not the same thing at all. Perikte masidain, roikus, asphalios, bibikos posi, cardius pleos. Roikus means means tough, uh, densely built. Roikus, asphalios can't push him over. Bibikos, bibikos posi, firm on his feet. Cradies pleos, with a heart as tough as stone, you can't move him. That's the sort of man, and of course that's the sort of mercenaries these people wanted. But if you didn't pay them enough, then you were in trouble because they would take over. This is what happens elsewhere. Well, uh, there are others like this. Uh, the Then there's one in here that, the first one, the oldest, from uh, is from Myrtilus. Everybody rejoices because Myrtilus is dead. Myrtilus, that right, we finally got rid of him. The whole de demon and so forth. Well, Simonides of Amorgus, he has some good ones here, but say we can't. But you see what the situation is here. Uh, Alcman in Sparta and the the maiden gaze. Now Alcman, he says, we have come here looking for a promised land, and uh, we came from where he puts it here in a beautiful thing. Kaipokai, uh, Alcman. Oh, here, and also marvelous nature poetry. This is a surprising thing because at an age of individualism, see these men as people become individuals now, they just remember, and they see things. And Lehi does. His, he has a beautiful casita when he recites that poem at the river of uh, Lehi in the Valley of Laden, uh, the river of Lemmy in the Valley of Laden. Uh, and uh, it's a true casita. And uh, Nephi gets quite ecstatic, as you know, about nature images about cutting up. And this is the famous, uh, this one night on the Gulf, on the Saronic Gulf, absolutely gorgeous. Heudu sin dorion corifai, tekai karadres. The mountain peaks are, are asleep, the purple peaks are asleep, and the uh, karadres, and the, the mountain, the waterfalls that, that come down from Proones to Karadre, and the, uh, yes, the Faranges, those are the ledges, the. The indentations of the valleys of the mountains. You have to know the Greek mountains are very mountains like these around here. So he, each aspect of the mountain has a description. So it's it's in the dusk you see and the waterfalls, through the kaipepeta and all the little things creeping around under the leaves and rustling here and there. Also trefemil and all the things which the black earth nourishes. Theres toreske on kaigenes melison and the prowling beasts of the mountains and. The bee, the busy bees are all asleep now, she see. Kai, and this is the nice part he adds, Knai, Knodalen, Ben Thesi, Parufres, Halos. There is a touch of the, uh, there is a touch of, of deep sea life, you see. The, uh, and the Knodal, the, the dolphins and the, uh, and the whales. He sees them lying in suspension in the purple, in the purple, deep, luminescent water of the deep, the benthic waters there. Well, even that, you see, he goes into the Cousteau aspect of the thing. He follows nature right from the mountains right down onto the water, and they're part of it. But this feeling of sympathy, we get great individualism here, and you also get the great genius and spirit of the Greeks here, very strong. Well, we don't want to get sidetracked on Greeks here, because we want to get the Book of Mormon. But there's a lot of this in the Book of Mormon. We'll see that so now. Now, uh, then we have these, uh, these deals. Well, Cyrus, remember, uh, Cyrus made a deal with the king of Babylon, and so they threw out Egypt. But then Cyrus uh, was a remarkable man. He's, uh, remember Croesus? Croesus, he conquered Phrygia. <coughs> he was the king of Lydia. Croesus with his money. He conquered Phrygia, and when he conquered everything else. So he went to the oracle, oracle at Delphi, it was international. Everybody from any country went to the Oracle of Delphi. It was free. You could go in there at any time. It was open. See, it's a worldwide open society there. And he, he asked if he went to war, <coughs> 
what would happen, and the oracle told him, if he went to war, he would overthrow a mighty empire. He was going to war against Cyrus of Persia. It was not wise. Of course, the mighty empire he overthrew was his own, but of course the oracle didn't tell him that. It's the way oracles talk. But uh, he went to war with Cyrus, which is very foolish. Cyrus came to Sardis, and when he was taking the city, si uh, Croesus had lost everything. Now, this is typical of the times. You lose everything, you gain everything. It's an age of takeovers, as I say, losses. And he got all his costly palace furniture and everything out in, in the marketplace, in the front of it, got on top of it, made a big bonfire, and started uh, to sacrifice himself. He wasn't going to live if he couldn't live on those circumstances. And as it started to burn merrily, Cyrus broke into the city, rushed to the marketplace, he saw the smoke ascending, and put out the fire, ordered his men to put out the fire as fast as they could. Well, uh, one story tells, of course, he, he prayed and there was a miraculous rainstorm and it delivered, and Croesus was delivered. Then Croesus became his best friend, and this is typical, Croesus became his very best friend and his advisor. Croesus, having experienced, traveled around with him and told him not to try to conquer the world, it wasn't the wise thing to do. Uh, and so, he wouldn't listen to him. Time and again, he saved his neck. But finally, he got there was one country that got under his skin. It was the land of the Massagetes, way in central Russia there. He hadn't taken the land of the Massagetes, which was north of his old Medea, Persia. Yeah? So he had to do that. But it was ruled by a woman, Tomiris, the great queen. <coughs> Croesus said, nothing doing, don't do it. But uh, Cyrus didn't listen to him. He went against it, and uh, she invited him. She invited this story of the king and queen like Solomon, the queen of Sheba, and so forth. Uh, she invited him to a banquet, and at the banquet she had him murdered. She had his head chopped off and put into a bag of blood, and she said, you wanted blood, I'll give you blood, because he had invited her son to a banquet and murdered him. And so he was foolishly enough thought because of his power he could trust himself. And uh, so that was the end of the mighty Cyrus. But Cyrus is followed by Darius, and he, go he goes into Egypt. Now what is an, a Persian from Central Asia doing in Egypt? He comes one of the best pharaohs. Out at Karga Oasis, he built a temple of Ammon, one of the most magnificent structures, and there is the most beautiful hymn to Ammon. Ammon, you see, Ammon is the common name of the Book of Mormon. It dominates through the Book of Mormon. Well, anyway, he, the hymn to Ammon you'll find, written by da Darius the First, in uh, uh, at the Karga Oasis in the temple there. His son Cambyses was a good man, but the Egyptians hated him, and they accused him of madness and all sorts of things. And but his son Xerxes, remember, was the one who marched against the Greeks. The Greeks overcame him at Marathon, and uh, in the Battle of Marathon, the one who won the Congressional Medal was Aeschylus and his brother. Now, Aeschylus wrote a play called The Persians, and he, t he gives an account of the Battle of, Battle of Marathon, and as a first hand, remember what we're dealing with is Xerxes, who is the son of Darius, and uh, this, who, who was a pharaoh in Egypt as well, and Xerxes was a pharaoh, and uh, was very close to Israel. Cyrus becomes one of the saints of Israel, the second Cyrus, because he delivers the Israel from Babylon, and so it goes. But anyway, uh, Aeschylus tells the problem, tells about the victory, the great victory of uh, the Greeks over the overwhelming Persian force at the Battle of Marathon there, I say, in, in which he took a, a stellar role. And in the middle of the play, in every play, the ghost has to appear. See, it's, it's a, a religious affoir, uh, like Hopi dance, you have to have the sipapu there, and it's there. There's an altar in the center of the stage, and there's a canistra, a sand, a sand patch where no mortal is supposed to set foot. This is the barren area, the neutral area between this world and the other world, where the play does not take place. The canistra is just dust at sand where nothing grows. In the center is an altar. The Hopis are arranged the same way. They have the altar, and then they have the two trees with the, the baho feathers on them, the spirit feathers. And that's the sipapu, the hole to the underworld, the from which the spirit appears. Well, in the middle of this play, at the climax of the play, uh, the play is, you would think, this is glory, this is, this is patriotic uh, flag-waving, letting the eagle scream and so forth. Not a bit of it. Xerxes is really the hero for Aeschylus. He comes in, when he comes in, he's utterly bedraggled and beat. It's after the battle, you see. All covered with dusk. He's been running, running for his life. His garments, his garments he's been torn and so forth. Anything but the mightiest king in the world as he comes in, and you pity him, and is, and... and the play ends on an upbeat note. His mother tells him, well, we've made idiots of ourselves. Let's go down and, and try to pick up the pieces, and everybody feels much better. But in the middle of the play, Darius appears, and he doesn't rebuke Xerxes, his son, for, for, uh, for hybris, for, for going too far. I'm going to have to mention that. He rebukes the Athenians. He says, let this be a lesson to you, Athenians. At this moment of patriotic triumph, you see, this, this was just right after the battle, right there. And... Uh, 
Of course, this was years later. He was uh, he was quite young, uh, the earlier time. But uh, in this patriotic fervor, he just throws cold water on the whole thing. He says, look, when you get rich and powerful, this is going to happen to you, Athenians. This message comes to you. Same thing in the Book of Mormon, remember? The greatest patriotic celebration they had was the celebration of the triumphant rule of King Benjamin, in which they had victory and triumph and prosperity throughout. He holds a great assembly of the nation, and all he does is tear them down, he says. And to put you in mind of your nothingness, he says, he says I would that you would remember. Keep in mind the goodness of God and your own nothingness, then you will always rejoice, and so forth. They had to, to teach them to rejoice. These four stages that, uh, that the Greek tragedians repeat, they're repeated in quite a number of plays, are the four that we follow. We follow them in the Book of Mormon, too. They are... Uh, Olbia, uh, Chorus. Yes, Chorus. We all know what Hybris is. And then A.T. This is what you go through. Olbia is happiness, prosperity, prosperity and everything, having what you want, and not, not necessarily getting it dishonestly. Pro prospering in the best possible sense is Olbia. But when you have that, then you get chorus. That means full after you're eating, when you had all you can eat and you consist on eating more, that's bad, that's chorus, that's overfilling, that's, that's forced eating, you've eaten too much when you have chorus. And that leads to this hubris, this overconfidence, you think you are so important, you automatically feel that you are the good guy, and what you do is all right, and so forth, and you take advantage of others, and then you start playing it, playing the game pretty rough. That's the way powerful people always do. So this is hubris, and the final stage is AT. AT is the point in which you participate in ending the play as fast as possible. When you've reached the point of no return, there is no la comedia finita, there's no point to continuing the play. You'll just, things will just get worse. As the Book of Mormon puts it often, you either are ripe in iniquity, if you get any riper than that, you rot, as Shakespeare says, or the cu cup of iniquity is full. You cannot dilute it anymore. There's nothing you can do about it. If it's full, you can't add anything to it. You can't take any, you can take anything, take something from it is what you're going to have to do, tip it over. But when the cup is full and when the fruit is ripe, you can't go anywhere after that. And that is the point of 80. Then the point is to end the play and not let the misery drag on. So everything the person does, he, he walks as if he was sort of hypnotized. And the things he says and does are, he's subconsciously aware of what he's doing. He's trying to get rid of himself. It's, it's almost a death wish that you have there. You want to end the play as, you, as fast as you can, and that's 80. You see, that will seize upon the people. Now, these great forces were, they all came out among the contemporaries. It was Lehi's day, say, that year 600, when this all comes to a head. This whole thing, the whole thing gets launched at that time. So there's no better period at which you could launch a new civilization than in the time of Lehi, because he was a colonist, he was a patriarch, a father leader, he was driven out of a city, they collapsed, we we're going to see what the collapse, he was a victim of the great powers and so forth, and, uh, but we have another element in here, and this makes quite a bit of difference, and the point is, this is so much like our own time and our own world, and the point is that uh, he has the gospel. Remember? He went out and he prayed. He's going to tell us right at the beginning of the first chapter. He was absolutely sick. He couldn't stand it. And then he went out and saw this, had his son stroke or what it was out in the desert. He ran home, threw himself on his bed back to the house of Jerusalem. Then he thought he was carried away. And then he saw what happened. He saw the council of the pre-existence. He saw the plan. He saw the Lord coming down. He saw the twelve apostles. He saw how it all worked out. And from then on, he was one happy man. And he went out. He was glad. He could do nothing but rejoice after that. He went out and tried to preach and ran into real trouble and had to leave town. Well, this is another story which we'll take up later. But this picture is a real one, and it includes ourselves. So many things are happening now that you think we thought would never happen before, as, as good old Euripides says, Kaito we thought this would never happen. We thought there would be forest fires, but not wipe out. It's not finished yet, a good part, say, of, of Yellowstone or things like that. And we thought that there would be breakup of the ozone, but not five times as fast as it's going now. Uh, we thought that uh, there would be a greenhouse effect, but we didn't think it would break. We thought it would take three or four or five hundred years. We didn't think it would take ten years, and so everything would be hastened now. And there's an acceleration. You notice throughout the Book of Mormon, there's a great sense of urgency, and this book was brought at a particular time for a particular place addressed to particular people. That this comes to you, O ye Gentiles, that you may be wiser than we have been. 
you don't have much time, but do what what you should do and don't do what you are doing. It keeps telling us. So the Book of Mormon has a real message for us. <laughs>